Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church of St. Paul. We are located in Matamidai, Minnesota. Good morning, and welcome to the online worship service of First Christian Church of St. Paul, which is located in Montemedi, Minnesota. I'm Dennis Sanders, and I am the pastor. We here at First would like to tell you that no matter who you are or where you are on your spiritual journey, know that you are welcome to worship with us. If you'd like to know more about who we are, and, who, and a little bit more about the denomination that we are a part of, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, please go to our website at fccstpaul.org. A few short announcements. The first is that we will begin our um, book study on Tuesday, January 26th at 6 p.m. on Zoom. And the book that we will be reading is Reading While Black by Esau Macaulay. If you are interested in being a part of this study, please email us at info at fccstpaul.org. You can buy the book on Amazon um, and other online sellers, and we would love to have you join us. The other thing is that Ash Wednesday is really just around the corner. And that is usually the, the time that we begin the season of Lent, and we do that with um, the placing of ashes on our foreheads. Uh, normally we, have, we do that inside, but because of the coronavirus pandemic, we're doing things a bit different this year. We will be outside on the, at the church parking lot um, where we will um, give people the ashes. Um, you will basically drive up and I and um, Pastor Rob Hamilton will um, give out the ashes, and then we will also um, hand out communion so that you can uh, take part in communion. And 
Don't worry, we will be using um, COVID-19 safety protocols, and we do want to make this as, as safe as possible. So we hope that you can join us uh, on Wednesday, February 17th from 4 to 5.30 here at the First Christian Church parking lot in Matami and I. We'd love to have you there. Well, today we hear probably one of the most well-known stories, especially to kids, and probably also one of the strangest stories, and that is, Joseph, uh, that is Jonah and the big fish, or whale, as I like to think it was. We he find out that Jonah is a prophet, and prophets are supposed to preach repentance. But Jonah was called to preach repentance to his sworn enemies, the, the Ninevites. So what does it mean that God sometimes calls us to extend grace to people that we think don't deserve it? Can God's grace be offensive? Today is the third Sunday in the season of Epiphany. Let us continue with worship. Brothers and sisters, I was glad when they said, let us go unto the house of the Lord. On this day, let us come to God in a joyful hope that his presence will give us a confidence to go through the uncertainty of our lives with love, 
with hope and with justice. The opening um, scripture will be Psalm 62. I'll read a, a small section of the text and if the Spirit moves you, you can respond by saying, God alone is my rock and my salvation. In this time, let us go to God in worship. God, the one and only, I'll wait as long as he says. Everything I need comes from him, so why not? He's solid rock under my feet, breathing room for my soul. An impregnable castle, I am set for life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we say we are better than others, we only deceive ourselves, for we all stand in need of God's love and God's grace in our lives. In this moment and in this time, in our season of our community, let us seek the brokenness in our lives in the honest hope and assurance that God's forgiveness will give us an opportunity to live into God's presence. Confident in God's grace for us, let us pray confession. And if the Spirit moves you, please say, Here, my confession, O oh Lord. O oh God, investigate my life. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I have done anything wrong, then guide me on the road to eternal life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do we have to fear? Our own broken and sinfulness? Know this, though, in God's abounding and boundless love for us, God became limited like us, bearing our sin in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are bold to profess that God's love will be with us for now and forever. Amen. Our text for today comes from the third chapter of the book of Jonah, verses 1 through 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave to you. Jonah obeyed the word of God and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty days more, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in dust. This is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals or herds or flocks 
taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let the people be covered in sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion and turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This is the word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. In 1968, Daryl Davis was 10 years old, and he was part of a Cub Scout troop in Massachusetts. He carried the, the American flag in a parade. And as he was walking, he realized that he was getting hit with cans and rocks. And the adults in the group came around him to protect him from the things that were being thrown at him. Well, he came home and his parents cleaned him up and they wondered what happened and he tells them. As he heard this, the, the parents realized that now was the time for them to have a talk about racism because Daryl and his parents were African American. And as his parents were explaining to him what racism was all about, the question that went through his mind is, how could someone hate me when they don't know me? And that question remained in his head for decades. Over time, he became a well-known musician, uh, playing jazz and blues and rockabilly and country on his uh, keyboard. And one night, he was in a uh, bar in Maryland, and a man who was impressed wanted to buy him a drink. And they sat down for drinks, and this man was amazed that he was actually talking to Daryl. And Daryl wondered, why? What, what's so special? The man replied that he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And so the two of them, having sitting down, having a drink, just talking, was kind of absurd. Well, that got Daryl thinking. He actually kept this relationship going between this man, this Klansman and himself. And he got even more curious. He wanted to know and, and, and really wanted to get to know the leader of this of the clan, the leader of this group of the clan. And, and he was able to set him up. And over time, he struck up a relationship with this man, Roger Kelly. And in this CNN, there was, CNN was of course amazed that this relationship even existed. And so they went and and interviewed both uh, Daryl and Roger Kelly. And there was footage of Daryl sitting there at Klan rallies, and it was kind of amazing to see this. They struck up this relationship that over the years, and it was interesting in this interview, this interview was probably from a long time, from probably 20, 25 years ago, but at the time, Kelly had said that they could have this relationship, but his views weren't going to change. They were cemented. Well, they really weren't. Because, of course, over time of having this relationship with a black man, Kelly changed. He changed so much that he left the clan, and he gave his clan outfit to Daryl. And Daryl has continued to create friendships with Klansmen over and over. He goes to the Klan rallies. They will come to maybe a, a concert or um, up to his home to meet his diverse friends. The thing is, is that these people were changed. 
they repented. Not by being shamed, but by simply having a relationship with an African-American man. Now, today, in the book of Jonah is probably one of the only books in the Bible that reads as if it were an episode of The Simpsons. And if you know The Simpsons, especially in its heyday in the 90s, it, what was so great about it was that they could use comedy to talk about social issues. And Jonah, if anything, is a comedy because it is just incredibly absurd. Jonah is a prophet, and prophets are called to preach to the people and to preach repentance. And Jonah, one day, was called by God to go and preach the pe peace repentance. That's usual. That's what he did. That's He did it all the time. But then God lowers the boom. God wants Jonah to preach repentance, not to his own people in Israel, but to Nineveh. And Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And they were enemies to the Israelites. So Jonah wasn't really that interested in going to preach repentance to his sworn enemy. So he, this, it, you know, the thing is, is that that seemed so bizarre, so absurd, kind of like a black man talking to a clan leader. So he decides to go in the other direction. He gets on a boat and he is trying to run away from God. But the thing is, running away from God is kind of like that big ball, white ball that floats that you see from the old TV show, The, the Prisoner. You just can't get away from God. And so... His boat gets caught in a storm. Long story short, he is thrown overboard. But God saves him by having a big fish come and eat him. And he's stuck now inside of this big fish. And he continues to pray for salvation. And he is brought out of the fish. Well, actually, he wasn't just brought out. He was vomited out of the fish. So now Jonah has no choice but to do what God says, to go and preach <clears throat> to the Ninevites. But deep down, he, believed, he wanted to believe that the Ninevites would not listen. They would not repent. And if they that happen, then great. He will have his, his wish that they don't repent and that they are punished. But to his surprise, they repent. Now, as an aside, I sometimes wonder if Jonah ever had a chance to shower after he was freed from the fish, because if he didn't, he was probably a sight, and considering how he left the fish, he probably smelled horrible. And maybe the sight and smell of a prophet made the people think that this had to be a clear sign from God. They have to repent. So, this thing would be, you would think, a happy ending. Except it's not, because Jonah isn't happy. He yells at God, and in fact, in chapter 4, which we didn't read today, but he says, This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anchor, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punish, punishing. I knew that, that God, that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Huh. So Jonah was mad because God was loving. It's always fascinating that people want a merciful God, but they want it for themselves. They don't want it for the people they don't like. Jonah was mad that the Ninevites repented. But what he didn't really know is that he also needed to repent of his hatred of the Ninevites. 
God's love and mercy go against the way of the world. God's love, if we really think about it, is offensive. God's love is scandalous. It, it is against what we want. As the old saying goes, if God loves the people you love and hates the people you hate, then probably you're not listening to God. Jonah really was just interested in wanting to make Israel great again. But God had in mind something far bigger. I've been reading a book the, recently, my latest book, is called Divided We Fall, and it's by David French. French is a conservative columnist, and he is bothered by the extreme polarization between liberals, or between progressives and conservatives in the United States. We have become a culture where we don't simply disagree, but we look at each other with contempt. And what we want to do is to dominate the other side. Part of how he explains what's going on is that he talks about two scenarios where the United States breaks up. One, the first one takes place in a center in California. And then the second scenario is centered in Texas. And both stories are chilling. There isn't any kind of bloodshed, really, but just the story itself is unsettling because people refuse to budge. They refuse to see things from another perspective. And in both sides, people keep escalating and escalating and escalating until everything falls apart. They could not see each other as a child of God. They could not see and see that these were people that God loved. God loves everyone. That is not just an empty statement. It is true. And the thing is here is, are we willing to love the people that are hard to love? Are we willing to love Trump supporters? Are we willing to love someone who's kind of way on the radical left? Are we willing to see someone that we don't like personally as a child of God? Because to be a follower of Jesus means that we have to learn to love a God who loves everyone. And that is really hard for us. But let's be honest, the way of Jesus is hard. It is never, ever easy. Daryl Davis' ministry to the Klansmen is absurd, it is shocking, and it is jaw-dropping. But the thing is, because of his willingness to talk to people that are difficult to love, hearts were turned. God's love is for everyone. Do we really understand what that means. Thanks be to God. Amen.
brothers and sisters in Christ. We come to God not because we have all the answers, but because God, in God's infinite love for us, gives us a path forward. In our brokenness, in our pain, in our suffering, we can find strength not in our own faith, but in God's faith for us. It isn't so much that we are so great, but in our limitedness, God's greatness abounds. Knowing this, believing this, we can go to God seeking God's love, strength, and hope. Let us pray. O good and gracious God, we come to you today in the midst of transformation in our nation. O God, give us strength to hear your small, still voice, which speaks truth in the midst of doubt, which speaks love in the midst of hate, which speaks hope in the midst of despair. O oh God, we remember the prophets as they told us that we ought to love justice, protect those who are the least among us, and humbly walk with you. O oh God, in this moment, may we be a discipline for those who would lead us, giving them the foresight and strength and courage to do that. O oh God, in a broken world, May our leaders find ways of building bonds of hope, not born of the cheap grace that accepts things just as they are, but a bold confession about a world better than now. O oh God, in the midst of the despair and brokenness that COVID has brought us, give us a confidence in your grace, your love for us, that we might know that love, that life-giving love, that allows us to live not in this moment alone, but in a hope of a better future. We pray for those who suffer, whether in body or mind or spirit. You are the great physician. No healing can take place, so may it be so. May those who care for them embody the best of you. God, we pray the prayer your Son taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Well, we'd like to thank you for worshiping with us here this morning. For our visitors, we hope to see you again. And we also hope that this experience of worship was nourishing to your soul. For those who are interested, the worship continues. Um, at 11 a.m., you are invited to join us for prayer and coffee. That takes place on Zoom. To join the meeting, simply go to our website and um, at the, this web address, fccstpaul.org backslash prayer and coffee. And that will get you in to our, um, our Zoom meeting. And we'd love to have you join us for coffee and conclude with prayer. With that, let us pray the benediction. As we go out to meet a changing world, remember this, God alone is our rock, our salvation. The risen Christ is calling each of us to share the good news of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is near and we are on the way. And all God's people say, amen. Go in peace, dear friends, to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Arise, your light is come. Um, according to the Canterbury Dictionary of Hymnology, um, this was written by Ruth Buck, um, who was born in 1947. Uh, one of the earliest hymns that she wrote published in Because We Are One People. Um, it is based on the verses from Isaiah 60 and 61. She uh, said that it was inspired by Lead On, O King Eternal, and Rise Up, O Men of God. Um, presumably in the sense that the texts, uh, the latter one especially, offended her and caused her to write an inclusive text. It was included by Eric Routley in Rejoice in the Lord in 1985, which was a great encouragement to Duck to continue writing. Arise, your light is come, the Spirit.